Today's episode is sponsored by Midwest Fire. For more than 20 years, Midwest Fire has been manufacturing high-quality tankers, tanker pumpers, and fire rescue vehicles in the United States and Canada. Keeping firefighters safe while enhancing their capabilities is what they do best. To learn more, go to MidwestFire.com. We can dance, we can dance, everybody look at your hands. We can dance, we can dance, everybody's taking the chance. Safe to dance, oh, it's safe to dance, it's safe to dance. Hello and welcome to episode 251 of the Situation Awareness Matters show. I'm your host, Rich Gassaway. The purpose of this program is to help improve situational awareness and high-risk decision-making for individuals and teams who work in high-stress, high-consequence, time-compressed environments with changing conditions. The SA Matters mission is simple. We want to help you see the bad things coming in time to avoid bad outcomes. I'm coming to you today from Denver, Colorado, where I'm in town to do some consulting work. Last weekend, I was in Columbia, Missouri, where I delivered three programs for the Missouri Winter Fire School. We had a great turnout for the three sessions, and when I finished in Columbia, I drove over to to (laughs) Petite... I drove over to Topeka, Kansas, where I delivered a one-day situational awareness program. Uh... Maybe on previous episodes, you've heard me talk about companion programs. Companion programs are events that are on adjoining days to other events. And the hosts are able to take advantage of some pricing discounts because I'm already in the area. That creates a win-win scenario. A great training opportunity at a reduced fee. And that's what Topeka did. They're an example of a companion program with a win-win outcome. And we had over 80 first responders, including fire, police, emergency management, from throughout the region. Thank you to Kevin Flory and the Topeka Fire Department for inviting me back. I say inviting me back because this was my second visit to Topeka. We had a lot of fun laughing while we were learning, and that just makes for a great day. Earlier this week, I interviewed Elyria Fire Department Assistant Chief Joe Pernesti about a program he does on fighting fires on Main Street, a special challenge we face when dealing with very old, legacy-era constructed downtown structures. You're going to want to be sure to tune in for that episode coming up here in just a few weeks. The feature segment today is the final segment of a three-part interview. If you haven't listened to part ones and part two yet, you may want to go back and listen to episodes 249 and 250. Um, It'll help improve your understanding of the lessons that are about to be shared in this segment. When the feature segment is over, stick around and I'm going to share some news about some things that we're going to be doing to celebrate our fifth anniversary of this show. Okay, let's jump into our feature segment, part three of my interview with the German Township Incident Commander Devrin Farmer, supplemented with contributions from longtime German Township Fire Chief, now retired, John Buckman. All right. All right, let's, uh, let's move into some, um, well, before we get into the lessons, um, can, you, um, can you first start by telling us what you did to learn the lessons? Because I know you went through a process of interviews and such. So take us through the process that you went through, and then we'll, and then we'll share what the lessons were. How did, how did you get to where you even were able to capture lessons? A lot of places have near misses like this, and you know, as long as nobody got hurt or killed, they just go on with life and they just, you know, consider it a, you know, a good day and move on. But you guys didn't do that. You, you hit the pause button and you said, we got to learn some things here. So before we get to the things you learn, talk me through the process of how you uh, learned the things you learned. Okay. I, uh, I was not here. I was not in Evansville. I was at my job in Indianapolis, which is about three hours from the home. And, uh, I got two phone calls, one on my state phone, 
and one on my personal phone from the same person. When that happens, I know it's important. So I took the second call and uh, I was told that German had an event and they had declared a mayday. I immediately turned my scanner app on my phone on, walked over to the state fire marshal's office, uh, Jim Greeson and a couple of the other guys from the training division. We all walked over there to start listening. And, uh, you know, I had, I had offers of like, oh yeah, we got lights and siren, we can go home, we'll get you home. It's like, well, you know, it's two and a half hours. Even if we use lights and siren, it isn't gonna make a difference. Uh, it didn't take very long before all firefighters out and accounted for, so I knew I did not have to come home. I did talk to, um, I think I talked to Devin a couple hours later. I talked to the fire chief and said, you know, I will, I will put together a lessons learned package. I knew I did not have to use the NIOSH report model of, of how to develop it. So we, we talked to the firefighters and said, there's something to be shared here. Things went on that could have been done differently that might make the difference if we do it differently next time. This is not to embarrass anybody. It's not to make anybody the, the, the culprit, the, to put blame on it or on them. It is to document the lessons learned. And we shared that with all the fire departments in this county and anybody, and it was on firefightercloscalls.com and a couple other websites. So we interviewed, we videotaped them, we have audio recordings, I asked them questions, what they were doing, why, why they did what they did, how they did it, where they were at, so on and so forth. And uh, I don't remember how long the report is, but it's probably about 20 pages. The one thing that is uh, unusual for this fire department is there are no pictures of the event. There is a video, dash cam video from the Scott Township Fire Department uh, when he, after he arrived, but he probably didn't arrive until right about the time May Day occurred. And so, you know, we don't have any of that initial uh, look. And so and usually we have somebody take a cell phone picture, the pump operator will take a cell phone picture, but because he was 400 or so feet away, uh, not, like I said, there's none of that. So we don't have anything to actually, as Devon is trying to describe the color of the smoke, you know, one of the things that I, that and I'm, I'm looking at my notes here, you know, Devon was about the changing color, smoke, velocity of the smoke, and heavy fire coming from the attic space. Would it be nice to have or some see what he saw? But all we can go on is his emotion, his re, uh, re, uh, telling of the story of the color of the smoke concerned me, the velocity concerned me. And then one of the big lessons learned, first one I said was you always have to trust your gut. If you've had training, you have experience and your gut is telling you this is not right, trust your gut and react accordingly. Do not second guess yourself because when you do, it may be too long for, for that to have occurred. So that, that was probably one of the first things that Devon and I talked about is as he walked around that building doing a 360, he wasn't feeling right, he has said that several times, and that my, that's my message, one message, trust your gut. Yeah, that, and that, that's a powerful message, because it's, it's hard to trust a feeling, <laughs> and that's really all the gut is, just a feeling, but it is a connection to a whole big database of unconscious knowledge, and that's a, that's a really solid piece of advice, is to trust that gut, even if you don't know exactly why, um, and and the and the value of all the knowledge that comes with that is the kind of the back support to the gut feeling. Those those who wonder about where the gut comes from, just swing by my website. Just put intuition in the search bar, and you'll see all kinds of things about you know gut feeling and where it comes from. Because that's solid advice right there, John. Trust the gut. Yeah. When we look at radio communications, you know it may have been too much radio communications. As with every incident where something bad happens. It's always about communication. Some of the communications was garbled. We have an 800 system here. It's a very good, very reliable system. We were pretty close to the 800 megahertz towers, but even still, we couldn't understand all the radio traffic, even if it was on the exterior. And then we still always have trouble talking through a face piece and getting that radio traffic out there. At that time, uh, I don't think German had the, uh, the new mask 
I believe we still had the odor mask without the, the amplifier on the microphone yet, where I think they were actually were on order, just hadn't come in yet. Uh, the other thing is, and I, I've said this for year, years, is, and it wasn't that bad on this incident, but sometimes we have Captain Radio and his son microphone show up on the scene. I'd like to give that guy about seven transmissions and then his radio would go dead. But you, when, you, when you're on this kind of event where lots of things are going on, sometimes you just need to keep your mouth shut. And that goes to where that the assistant chief in, in, um, in, inducted himself into the event without him having a good picture of what's going on, a total picture of what was going on, or having experienced the first 17 minutes of all that radio traffic. And knowing that that's what the Scott Township Fire Chief, he had been listening, he had been responding, he heard all that stuff. He knew we need resources now. The mutual aid standby companies are the closest mutual aid. Don't wait for the second alarm companies. Get the closest mutual aid there. So, you know, sometimes just because you have a radio and it has a battery that's operational, you don't need to key up. Be quiet. Um, the, the size up was not good here because again we're about 400 feet off the off the road we don't we can't have don't have access to get a good size up plus we now had to hand stretch hose and pre-connects and you know they didn't do a 360 as they admitted because they're in a hurry uh, the fire's getting bigger the wind is making it get bigger and they're thinking well we better get to work here and i would say we we always hurry to get to work on a fire but we don't hurry to get to work on a rope rescue. We don't hurry to get to work on a drowning. Why? Why is it any different? How, how different would it be if we'd have taken the extra 15 seconds to complete a 360? How would that have changed the decision making that they made? Maybe they would have still went in. I'm not saying it. Going in was the appropriate decision here. This was not an exterior firefighting. Uh, of exterior firefighting operation. This required aggressive interior operations. But would they have went in a different door, gained access from a different way? Would they have need, maybe considered ventilation of the roof before they did in With extra time. Time is, we know time is a killer, both for us and against us. But a little, yeah, and again, I've been doing it a long time, so I'm much more patient today than I was back when I was the incident commander in, in the early days. But I'm telling you, that's what experience teaches you. We don't have to be in such a big hurry to make rush decisions without getting 90% of the information that we need. Now, let me ask you a question. When you were interviewing them, I, I assume from this conversation, they took the hose line through the front door on the A side. Is that a fair assumption? Yes, sir. Okay. When you interviewed them, did you ask them why they chose that door to advance the line through? I'm trying to think what, I think we discussed it. I, I, I would, yeah, I think it, it's the homeowner influence, the door for them to go in. Yeah. You know, and then that, that happens. You, you know, it's like the homeowner standing here, here's the door. Right. At the front, that's where you're going to go. Yeah. Yeah, and I think perhaps, um, and you know this, John and Devon both, that the, so I think sometimes the homeowner influences are shortcutting the best practice of 360 size up because they're standing there, their house is on fire, they expect us to go in and put it out, and, you know, if doing, pausing and doing the 360 is, a, you know, we're like saying, oh, hold on a minute, I'm, I'm not quite ready to go in and put your fire out, I'm going to, I'm going to, by maybe their assumption of what the homeowner would think. I'm going to waste a little time here walking around your house when the, when the homeowner says, oh, the fire's right in there, you know. And I think sometimes we feel this sense of pressure from not this homeowner, but bystanders and others who might judge us if we don't arrive and then immediately do something, that if we take that pause to figure out what the problem is, before we start throwing around a solution, it's a best practice, but we seem to just – for some reason, miss that critical piece of the of the formation of situational awareness. That that very beginning, the gathering the intel that drives good decisions. And you know, here here for whatever reason, 
Uh, well, let's say whatever reason. Did did they offer a reason why they didn't do the 360? Oh, was it or was it feeling that sense of urgency to get things done quick? I I, I think again, it was a big house. It took them a long time to get the hand line stretched. I mean, not necessarily a real long time, but it took time. And it's, they're like, like, well, I can go ABC. I can look around the back of the seaside. Okay, it looks pretty good. I'm ready to go to work. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you're right. I think that, you know, the homeowner influence, you know, he's there. You know, he basically said, you know, I, I was burning leaves. And I, you know, in essence, I started this. And so I'm sure he had some influence on their decision making of, you know, if you go in right here and turn left, you know, it's right over here. So I, I think that led to a ready, fire, aim situation where, yeah. where we, we did all the right steps. We just didn't do them in the right sequence. So. Yeah. So if, if you could, I know we got still some lessons to unpackage here, but I want to share a few, few comments that have been coming in on the, on the Facebook feed because I think they're, um, they're pretty pertinent to the uh, discussion we're having here. So one of the questions, uh, Devron, was for you. And it says, how many decades did that incident commander age between the time he called for them and, and then called the Mayday until they were accounted for? Wow. That, yeah, absolutely. It felt like probably 10 years. <laughs> it, uh, it, it, was, it was just, the whole thing was surreal. It just, it, it was almost, it was like it wasn't happening because I just, I couldn't connect the dots on a couple things that to me seemed so obvious. Why won't you answer me when we just talked 30 seconds ago? And and so I'm, I'm struggling mentally with the disconnect on that. Never dawned on me that they probably dropped a radio. I mean, that was too advanced. I was just like, why are you not answering? And, and that's what got my anger up. I'm like, we just were talking. Now you won't respond to me. Uh, it, that, was, that was the frustrating thing for me to just mentally kind of wrestle with. I'm like, where are these guys? How, how are we not still having a communication? It just ceased. Yeah. So. That was, but yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I needed a break after that run. Yeah. So uh, here's, here's another comment that um, is actually in defense of what you did there, Jim. It said, if the, I, if the incident commander had not called the Mayday, that would have been negligent to not call that Mayday under those circumstances. And, uh, and I think that's a really good observation from Jim Dillon on the, on the Facebook feed. And thank you, Jim, for contributing to that. And um, so, all right, let's, uh, let's, let's continue on with some of the lessons that were learned. Well, one of the additional lessons learned is, you know, we, we've talked about four people and three people on the first do mutual aid company and two people on the next do engine and, you know, home response people responding direct. But the reality is that we at German Township most always respond with limited staffing. And one of the lessons learned and that the you know, action required with the fire chief was, we got to continue to communicate with people. You are limited by the number of people that you have on the scene of what your strategic and tactical options are. And you have to realize that you are not a city fire department where you get a guarantee of 12 people or 16 people on the first two company. You're not in Indianapolis where you can respond 50 people in 15 minutes, that you have to uh, select the strategy and the tactical application of that strategy based upon your staffing level. And when you ignore that staffing level and select a strategy without taking that into consideration, you're setting yourself up for possible failure. So the other part was about gaining, or another lesson learned again, I already mentioned that we are not a truck company fire department. We don't do a lot of truck company work. Yes. Hold on, John. What, one, I, wanna, I wanna contribute one piece to what you said about the staffing level. Uh, I, I just don't want it to pass by. It's both quantity and quality of that staffing. You know, if you have if you have four A team players, uh, you, the incident commander, your stress level can go down some because you know you got four really talented, top notch, really smart, really fit on that team, but quality. Um, and I say quality is as far as uh, experience level, training level, fitness level, that that factors as well. And when you have people coming from home, as you do, um, you don't always know your crew quantity or quality until you get on the scene and you do that quick. OK, what kind of cards did I get dealt today? I got four. But which four? Because it's important. 
So I just wanted to put a little acknowledgement to, to not just well, the crew size, but the quality yeah. as well. That, yeah, as Deborah said, he didn't know who was on the interior crew. And it, it, that is written in the report yeah. that experience mm -hmm. is an unfriendly teacher. Seasoned firefighters will not always be on the initial scene. They may not be first on the scene. So <clears throat> I use the word capability is whether they're the 18 member or not. It's, it's, it's what their capability and what is their experience level. So, yeah, we, we did write that up as part of the report. So you, uh, Deborah, you knew you had three in there, but you didn't know which three? Yeah, I didn't. I didn't have, uh, uh, you know, I didn't know exactly which three. I knew I knew the captain uh, who was running the pump asked me to be, uh, 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 you know, commanding officer. Uh, at that time, they had already advanced their hose line and gone in the building. And so, I, you know, there was a lot to process. I did not know which three I had. So what do, what do you guys do as, an, as, a, as a standard course of practice, notwithstanding what happened on this day, but what do you do as a standard course of practice for the incident commander with personnel accountability as far as knowing crew quantity, crew quality, uh, how many's inside, it, you know, do you, a part system, a tag system, uh, you know, notwithstanding what happened this day, but what would be the normal course of, of business there? Well, I'll, I'll answer that question just in general, not just about this event. So I just asked it about two weeks ago, we had another structure fire and I was asked, what's your accountability? And I said, and I was instant commander on this fire. I said, I have 29 people on scene. I don't know exactly who they are. I know I got three people on this hose line. I got six people on that hose line. I got these people doing that, but I don't know who they are and what, and exactly what they're doing. This is a volunteer fire department who does home response and we struggle with accountability. We struggled when I was fire chief with accountability. This is not a new problem. It is a continuous problem. And, and you know, Rich, you and I both travel around the country. And for a, an all-volunteer home staff department to say they have accountability system, I want to see it functioning. Yeah. Because anybody who says they have one, it's not like a career fire department where the battalion chief knows I got Jim, Devon, Rich, and Johnny on engine one. And Johnny has just came back from sick leave. You know, we, 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 we don't. So uh, yeah. our accountability system is not as good as it could be. And we, but we recognize that mm -hmm. and work, work to improve it constantly. Do you, do you use any tags or anything like that in your yeah. system now? Yeah. We have tags. Yes. And, and, and I guess if that could have been inserted into it, you know, I could have stopped taking the time, looked at the tags and said, okay, I know this guy, I know this guy, you know, it, it would have been an extra layer in the processing of who do I have on the inside? Um, I, not that that is good or bad, but I, you know, if I had had the extra time to do that. Or staff. I mean, or staff. You know, if, yeah. if, again, remember all this occurred in about 17 minutes and he was on scene at nine and so he basically is on scene in six minutes. So if we'd had a command aide riding with him, yeah. that would have been the command aide's job to have went and got that. Or if we'd had, again, some extra people. But that, in our world and in most volunteer fires, volunteer staffed organization world, that's not reality. You pull up with one, two, three, or four people, it's time to go to work, appropriately yeah. go to work. Yeah. And even if you, <laughs> in defense of this, even if you had a tag system, and they put those tags on a board and left that board, say, set on the front seat of the engine. That was 400 feet away. And, you know, as it, it, Devron's trying to command this thing with eyes on the incident and the hose line on the inside, he would not have probably thought or even taken the time to go down the drive 400 feet to get that, to retrieve those tags and kind of disengage from the active command of the incident. You know, as we talk about this after the fact, the whole thing seems, you know, we, we, we're not in the context of the time compression and the stress of the incident as it's happening. You know, it, it's, it's not very plausible to think that that commander would disengage from the incident and go back to the first in vehicle to retrieve those, those tags in, you know, in the moment, you know, and so, one of the other lessons learned is this was an attic fire, a very well advanced attic fire. And the reality is when you have an attic fire, most of the time you burn the attic off the house. So we risked people. The homeowner had already told us there's nobody in the house. 
We have limited staffing. We risk people. Our capability may or may not be good to be pulling ceilings. And we, we didn't recognize the problems that the attic fire was giving us. Okay. So um, take, take me through some more of your lessons. Okay. Um, decision making on the strategy and tactics uh, needs to take into account size of the fire, ability to access the structure and the seat of the fire, staff capability and availability. So as part of that initial decision making process, those three things have to be taken into account. Play those three again for me, John. Size of the fire, ability to access the structure and the seat of the fire, staff capability and availability. Theoretically, there's five of five things there. Size of the fire, access to the fire, staff capability, staff availability, and then access to the structure. Okay. Um, we're developing a set one again these are action required in the report we wrote up some things that the fire chief uh, should consider doing it is deter develop an assessment tool that is to determine the capability level of current members as well as the experience level and by that you know we, we all say okay you're a man in the statement again you have what's called a mandatory training level or a firefighter one level and okay, firefighter one means you can do 84 skills, but what skills are you good at? So when you look at capability, are you good at pulling hose, donning air packs, raising ladders, setting up vent fan? Well, I would hope those are some basic tools that you're really good at, but um, maybe climbing on a roof, you may not be good at that. Well, if I'm this in community, I've got two guys who are not good at climbing on a roof, and I'm going to tell them to cut a hole in the roof, it ain't going to work. So that was one of the things is develop an assessment tool to, to do that. And, and we have one. I, I helped develop one. Actually, I've had one for quite a few years. So um, we already mentioned about trust your gut. Uh, so I'll say that one more time. Um, look at risk versus reward. Uh, even though this was a great big house, and at that time the fire was, was not maybe engulfing the entire house, but it was an attic fire. I, I'm repeating myself on the attic fire because we don't get a lot of attic fires, but every time you read about attic, turn the attic off. I mean, they burn the top of that off, but you're not gonna stop in most cases. So uh, that was one of them. Uh, offensive attack. You know, you mentioned that a little bit earlier. Would it, and this was a question we asked them, because again, the fire was, you know, we were on the A side, went to the B side, the fire started on the B side, with gust up to 23 miles, blowing miles per hour, blowing from the B to the D side, what would have, what were the consequences have been if we would have done an offensive attack from the exterior? If we would have put water on it from the exterior, would that steam have helped slow down the forward progress of the fire until we got additional people and then go inside and start pulling ceilings? We don't know the answer to that question. It's just a question to ask to sort of put into everybody's mind is offensive does not always mean interior. Put water on it from a safer position as you can, as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. um, a mayday policy for, for everybody in this county. Uh, we, have, we all have them, but what, what uh, steps are implemented when a mayday is declared, our, the dispatcher here did a great job. She did not intrude, she did not interfere, but when the person with the most powerful radio, that when there's a situation where the person with the most powerful radio needed to talk, she talked. Interior, exit the building. Now, so it wasn't a walkie talkie talking, it was a dispatcher. You could tell, if you listen again to her, she, uh, she came ac across a lot clearer than Devon did. So mm -hmm. that there, you know, that that dispatcher is a key component of a Mayday policy, a key component in all of our operations. Yeah, let so, me ask let me ask a question about that, John. Has historically have the dispatchers been involved in Mayday training and did what this dispatcher did at this incident simply reflect her training, or did she just do intuitively what she thought she should do 
from a dispatcher's perspective, notwithstanding that there wasn't a policy for her to interject and say what she did, what she did was good, but was it really part of the bigger Mayday procedure that she integrated into? No, Rich. She did not do this because of her training. Okay. She did it because of her experience. Okay. She did it because of policy. And she did it because she was engaged. And we, we couldn't have asked for a better dispatcher on this event. And Devron has something to say about that as well. Yeah, you'll have to help me remember, because I, I did. I got to go down to dispatch afterwards. And, and uh, the next day, I believe, I just I got in the car and I drove down there. And I said, you know, you were, you, you were the voice I could hear through the radio that I just, it was like the reassuring voice, right? As John pointed out, her, her communications were loud. They were, they were clear. And I knew somebody was hearing me, right? I, I, my interior crew wouldn't respond. But when I heard her repeat some of my instructions, and, and not every single one, but based in the, you know, the amplification of my anxiety and my voice, she repeated the exit, the building, and then later repeated the mayday. I at least felt like I had somebody out there who could hear me. Yeah. And we, we ignore our dispatchers. General, I mean, I'm, I'm just not just talking about German Township. For the fire service and police law enforcement, we ignore dispatchers. We don't thank them when they need to be thanked. We don't appreciate them when they, they should be appreciated. We just think, well, they're that person on that radio. They're that invisible, that ghost that we hope is there when we need them. Yeah. And we need to we need to be more appreciative and thank our dispatchers. Uh, absolutely, and integrate them into our training. You know, I I do a not to talk about the trainings I do, but one of the th trainings is for dispatchers. I do a, a situational awareness training for dispatchers called "Do You See What I Hear?" <laughs> do you in the field see what I'm hearing from a caller, and how to integrate that shared awareness and that shared communications between dispatch and the field. And the reason I asked that question, John, about the dispatcher and their integration into the training, I was doing a, a training once for dispatchers. And one of the dispatchers in that session said that she was dispatching when there was a fire incident and there was a mayday. And she said, she turned to her partner who was sitting in another console and said, they just said mayday. What does that mean? She didn't know. I mean, she knew it meant something bad, but she didn't know what it meant. She didn't know what she's supposed to do. She said, I felt helpless. I felt out of the loop. I felt like I didn't know if I was supposed to talk or sit quiet. I, I had no idea because they had never extended an invitation for the dispatchers to be part of the understanding of what is their role when a mayday occurs. And their role when a mayday occurs can be pretty darn critical. But if they don't know what to do, you know, in, in your case, you ended up with somebody who, who was able to draw on experience and, and do the right thing. But I, I think a lot of dispatchers are, as you say, John, underappreciated, but maybe even underprepared for how to support us in these critical incidents. Yeah, well, and we would agree with that. And, you know, I want to say, you know, Rich, don't forget to send Leslie a note and tell her how good I talked about dispatchers. So, <laughs> for those out there, my wife's the deputy director of the 911 center here, so I'm sucking up to her, too. <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't uh, the dispatcher that day, was she? No, she wasn't. No, she okay. doesn't do dispatching. She, oh, okay. she does her payroll, so. Yeah, oh, you know, okay. But, uh, uh, other thing, uh, we have a command checklist and use a command checklist. The command checklist helps you uh, manage the incident in con consistently, that you don't skip key steps. So uh, what, what, whatever, you know, we have our own checklist. Actually, they still use a checklist that I developed some years ago. And uh, everybody has a, a little pocket card, a five by seven pocket card fits in their fire coat pocket that again has the different things you should be doing as the incident command. Did, did, did you have that with you, uh, Devron? And, and, and if so, did you use it? I did not. Um, I, I actually did not have the card with me. Uh, I, and again, I, I, you know, I helped develop it over, over time back in the day when we first started coming up with the command check, uh, checklist actually used to be, uh, we would, uh, laminate it or tape it to the back of your radio. So you actually had it on your radio as well. Uh, but, um, no, I, it was a less, it was a takeaway for me. Uh, it could have helped me 
uh, you know, just sequentially work through the steps to make sure I had all the boxes checked. So that was one of my takeaways. Okay. Uh, other things that, that you know, in, in the report, action required, these are not necessarily lesson learned, but training on the new modern, new or modern strategy and tactics. Uh, this, this was a legacy house uh, versus a modern new, new construction, but we need to increase training of, of that. Uh, training together uh, for the county fire departments. We talk about it, but we don't uh, train together. We are now having county training officer meetings. So we are working to do quarterly training combined so we can know each other. It's sort of funny that here I am, I'm gonna trust you with my life, but I've never trained with you. And so that, that, that's moving ahead farther, or going, going farther. Um, that's a, that's okay. a great, great example. You know, talk about one of the awarenesses is, is team awareness. So as we talked about that crew quantity, crew quality, that's team awareness. And that's a lot easier to develop when you know the team members. And we use that, as you say, John, mutual aid and auto aid. We have these team members coming in that we don't necessarily know very well. And then we bring them into a high risk, high consequence environment and we give them an assignment and we expect them to perform it. And then we get in our mind, okay, I've given that crew that assignment. I'm going to give them about six minutes to get it done. Well, maybe it's six minutes for an A team to get that assignment done, but it'd be 10 minutes for, a, say, a C team to get it done. But you don't know that because you, you don't know them that well. So that, 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 that dual training not only in, increases the, um, the coordination of skills across departments, but it also increases that awareness of who, what, what skills do those players bring to to the table in that in that moment of greatest consequence. Well, uh, two more lessons learned or action action required, I guess, of where we are now is that uh, uh, look at policies and procedures and make sure that they are consistent. And and here's here's one of the things I get, and I'm and you know I'm probably going to get in trouble with this statement, is when you have a bunch of fire chiefs who get in a room and everybody agrees except for one, the hell with the one, move forward. Don't let the tail wag the dog. And, you know, we have that. We, you know, we, we have ideas. Other chiefs propose things, and the one guy get up and go, I don't want to do it, and then they stop. It's like, you know, if six out of seven are doing it, it's better than none out of seven. So, you know, you know Jimmy doesn't want to do it. Okay, Jimmy doesn't want to do it. Fine. But we're going to move ahead, Jimmy, because it's the right thing to do. So when you say, when you, oh, hold on, when you say those consistent policies and procedures, you mean consistent regional policies and procedures. Yeah, command yeah. procedures okay. used by each department can be standardized and improved upon. Yeah, okay. All right, good, good lesson. Keep going. We, uh, we did not, because they're not on our move up system, the city of Evansville, we had a mutual aid engine drive past two city fire stations, staffed one with five and a quint, and one with four on an engine. And they will come, but they had not been put into the fire, uh, working fire move up system. They, do no, they won't do standby at the station, but they could have probably been on scene probably before the May Day occurred yeah. and, mm. you know, and been able to be deployed a little bit quicker than what the mutual aid was. Now, two weeks ago, uh, on another working fire, fully involved upon arrival. Uh, I was the incident commander. I did call for an Evansville Fire Department, Quint. They responded. They walked up, said, what do we do? I said, follow that hose line and go to work. You know, I'd give them a few more directions, but uh, they went to work. I don't know, half hour, 40 minutes later, said, we're done. The fire's out back there. He said, what do we do now? I said, you guys are released. They said, oh, cool. And I said, this is the greatest thing about mutual aid. You don't have to roll up any hose. Get back on your truck and go home. They go, never thought about that. I go, yeah, mutual aid is great. Now, let, let me ask you a question, John, because Evansville is a fully career IA, IAFF represented department. Are there any challenges there between um, career and volunteer or, or you know, any concerns about um, uh, cooperation on you know, mutual aid with, with the city like that? Okay, they're, they're not at the chief level. The Evansville Fire Chief, the Operations Chief, attends, attends the monthly uh, chiefs meetings or the bi-monthly chiefs meetings. 
Uh, they contribute, they participate. They have both said, you need us, you call us, we'll come. And, you know, are there personality issues? Yeah, it might be, but we've, Germans had them out, say twice in the last five years. Um, and again, never been a conflict, never an attitude. Uh, most, many of the career guys that go on episode now come from the volunteer fire departments. And so it's not, not, not a big deal. Okay. All right. Good, good. It's, that's not the case everywhere. Um, but I'm, I'm glad it is the case there because it, that's just a little, that's just an added level of stress you don't need in an incident is wondering, you know, are you going to get, you know, some, some, I don't know if Devin has anything else to add, but that's all I got. <laughs> Devin, what do you got to say in closing? Well, it was, um, you know, it, it was really an interesting event. Uh, like I said, I, I, that my takeaways were just as John mentioned, but some of those were from my notes initially is just trust your gut. You know, I just, it didn't feel right. It didn't look right. It didn't smell right. And, and I, I, you know, maybe for a fraction of a second, I felt a little pang of guilt for asking them to leave. Uh, but I just, I kept telling myself, it's just, you know, I, I, cause I know what it's like, you know, I, that's why we joined the fire department, you know, go inside, kick the door down, you know, run through the house, spray the water. And now I'm going to, I'm going to put a stop to that for these guys. So I kind of felt bad for just a second. But then I'm just standing there looking at this smoke saying, it's just, it's not right. It just doesn't feel right. And, uh, and, and then when they didn't respond, right, when I, when I just had communications and now you won't talk to me, uh, the, kind of wrestling with some of those emotions for a little bit. You know, I'm, I'm scared for them. I'm scared f for myself or them. Uh, I'm, I'm angry. Uh, and, you know, trying to process just through some of the emotions that you don't normally expect. I don't expect to show up and be angry, right? And so now I'm sitting here going, not, I'm, I'm really ticked off at these guys. Now I got to process my anger with them. And, and some of that comes out through the radio traffic. You can hear just my elevated uh, combination of, of both fear and anger uh, kind of going through some of that radio traffic. So it's, it was an interesting, you know, if I sat and did a, you know, after action review on myself, I wouldn't have assumed before the run that, that anger uh, would have been one of my uh, things to kind of wrestle with. So, uh, but until you're, you know, kind of in that situation, you just, you're, you're trying to process and it, when A and B are not adding up and it's just, you just get frustrated. Mentally, I was just really kind of wrestling with some of the frustration of them not wanting, uh, or at least acknowledging that they heard me. So right. but, uh, I'm glad everybody made it okay. So, so I, I want to pause for just a moment because you said you felt this pang of guilt and you just kept on going. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. W what do you mean? Well, how, did, how do you, how do you, how did, how did that feel? What, what was that little inside voice in your head saying to you, trying to maybe talk you out of ordering them out? You know, you got you to gotta talk us through that. Yeah, I guess some of that would have been, you know, in hindsight, maybe just some self-doubt. You know, I'm, I'm making the decision for everybody on the fire ground and my decision is we're done here. Right. And then, so, and it was, you know, just a millisecond, but it's like, you know, it's that little voice going, yeah, give them another minute. Right. They're in there working. Just give them another minute or two. Maybe, maybe they will put some water on something. You will see some steam. So it, it all happened really fast, but that was that just moment. I don't know if I'll call it self doubt, but I'm just, I'm double checking myself going, you really want to do this. You, you're really going to pull the lever and say, we're done now. And, you know, it, it took just a, a millisecond to go, yeah, that's what we're doing. Because the next thing I know, I'm on the radio. But, but in reviewing it, you know, later that night at home, I thought for a second, you almost let them stay a little longer, right? That, and, that, uh, that's the courage that a lot of commanders can't muster in the moment to, to, trudge over that, <laughs> that that feeling of guilt that feeling of self-doubt and actually squeeze that radio and make that everybody come out call i've i've interviewed some of them and uh and, and i have been there too and i won't tell you that i always uh showed the courage to order them out in time you know i there are times when i said you know i'll just give them a few more minutes and a few more minutes. And cause you know, when it, when the fire converts from that black smoke, the white smoke, it all happens rather suddenly, you know, and you, and you just kind of like, well, if I just wait another minute, maybe I'll just see that big conversion. And then, right. 
breathe that sigh of relief and all will be good. And that's a, that's a tough spot to be in to make that call. Yeah. yeah Rich, I would tell you that, that that's experience. We, we can, we can harp on this guy who's, this is his first year of being incident commander. You've got to get some experience. Education and training is important, but you've got to have some experience. When you get some experience, you, you, and, and I don't mean all personal experience, read the line of duty death reports. Talk to fire chiefs who had close calls. Ask them the tough questions because they'll probably give you the tough answer. And, and that, that to me is, is what we don't do a very good job of is we don't share our story. We're worried about liability. You know, in 1979, I didn't get sued. I put nine firefighters in the hospital. I was not sued. How many lawsuits would I have today? At least nine. <laughs> well, the outcome is we're gonna, if we're going to change the way inexperienced incident commanders make decisions, they can learn from others' experience. So share your stories. Yeah. Amen. Um, well, one, uh, I guess we'll, we'll put a, I'll give, share one comment from the Facebook feed and then we'll, we'll put a wrap on, on the, uh, in the interview. This one actually comes from Marty Mays. I want to give a little shout out to Marty because Marty just created a, a movie or just produced a movie and published this movie on, um, available in the, uh, in the Amazon store called the fire asylum. And what Marty did is take some firefighters to the old penitentiary at uh, the West Virginia State Penitentiary in Moundsville, West Virginia, and put them through kind of like a training crucible. And uh, I've been there. Not yeah. a prisoner. Yeah, right. Yeah. Well, Marty, Marty did this, and then they they made a movie of it. And you know, it's it's probably as much about how to work your way through physical challenges as much as mental challenges. So I want to put a little shout out to the Fire Asylum in the movie that's now available on Amazon. But I say all of that to say that, that, that Marty uh, come onto the podcast uh, on the Facebook feed and said, excellent podcast. And please thank the guests for their openness and their honesty, because uh, a lot of times it's difficult to be that raw and honest about things that you did, what you were thinking, reflecting back and saying, if, could do it again I might do something differently or think about this in a different way um, and to share how challenging it was to make those those tough calls and uh, so I want to I want to kind of wrap the interview by saying thanks to both of you for coming on sharing sharing the story sharing the lessons learned um, on the podcast itself uh, when I make this f the final version I'll pay I will play the uh, full, I think it's about 11 minutes of the audio because we did stop the audio and got the conversation on and didn't continue the audio on. So I'll play the full audio piece in the, uh, in the full, the full version, the edited version of the podcast. So people can hear that too. And uh, so th thank you guys for coming on to the show and, and, and sharing your lessons. And Rich, if, I think I sent you the after action report. I mean, if you want to post that on your website, if you can't find it, send, it, send me a note and I'll send it to you. But, you know, okay. the after report has all the most, all this stuff in writing yeah. as well as some other stuff yeah. that uh, if people are interested, they are certainly welcome to have. Sketch of the house, layout, where the first hose lines were stretched, oh, where, yeah. the, where the backdraft occurred. Yeah. Yeah. I'll put, I'll, yeah. I'll definitely put that in the show notes on my website and make it a clickable link that they can go through and, and download it and use that. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Um, one other, one other thing I'm going to ask you to do, John, that uh, I don't think I have, and, and that is that, um, that checklist you guys talked about. So if you could uh, just kind of like do an a, a iPhone screenshot or something of that. I have it in preview. And, and send that along. I'll, I'll put that in the show notes as well so people can see what that checklist looked like. Cool. No problem. All right. All right, guys. Thanks for being on the show. I appreciate it. You're welcome. Okay. Take thanks. care. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you to Devron Farmer and to John Buckman for sharing the details of the incident, the after action review process, and the lessons learned for others to benefit from. Well, I never thought we would make it this far. Our show is approaching its fifth anniversary. I'm very proud that we have the longest running, consistently broadcasted, independently operated show focused on a singular mission 
to improve the safety and survival of individuals and teams who work in high risk, high consequence environments. Let me pause for a moment and elaborate on one component of that last statement, consistently broadcasted. A new episode of this show comes out every week. And for the past five years, I've not missed putting out a new episode. Never, ever. No other podcaster in this space can make that claim. In fact, most of them fade out after just a dozen or so episodes uh, or put out a show sporadically now and then. And you never know when to expect a new episode. Not with us. You can set your clock by it. Every Tuesday morning, you're going to have a fresh episode to watch or listen to. It's my promise to you. And I have to admit that it's not always an easy promise to keep. My travel schedule means that sometimes I'm doing those recordings and editing after midnight because I know I have to keep my promise to get that show out by 7 a.m. And I totally understand why some other shows fade or are inconsistent. Um, I can attest also to how lonely it is here behind the mic and behind the camera. And, and by lonely, I mean we rarely get any feedback. Sure, we see the stats that tell us the episode's getting some downloads and some views, but rarely does anyone ever write a review or send an email with some feedback about the show. So I never really know if the show is inspiring others or it's, it's not. But I keep putting it out there, and I will continue to put out the best possible safety-focused content that I can. Now, to honor those who are watching and listening to this show, I'm going to do a giveaway of products from our sponsors and other supporters. Listen to upcoming episodes and watch the SAMatters.com website for more on that. Real expectations because SA matters. Know your limit. Know your partner's limit because SA matters. Assumptions are bad. SA matters. Proper PPE is important because SA matters. Flawed situational awareness is a really big deal. SA matters. Know your water supply because SA matters. Bears and cougars. SA matters. Go versus no go because SA matters. Confidence is good. Overconfidence is bad. SA matters. Studies matter because SA matters. SA matters, so don't get angry. When the pigs are eating lemons, SA matters. Our academy class is going home today because we know that SA matters. SA matters! The Situational Awareness Matters show was launched back in 2014 with a purpose to give a platform to those who have had near miss events to share their stories just like the one you just heard. When I'm on the road delivering classes on situational awareness, I often ask the attendees about near miss events that they've had and they have shared some amazing stories. And it's those stories like Devron Farmers, the ones you just listened to, that motivated me to launch this podcast and to give a voice to a bigger to them to a bigger audience. The Situational Awareness Matters show, podcasted as SA Matters Radio, and companion on our video, SA Matters TV on YouTube, along with other videos that we have posted there, have enjoyed over 800,000 downloads. That number blows my mind, and by far exceeds all my expectations. I am so thankful for your support and I feel so honored to be able to provide a platform for these amazing stories to be shared. If you like the show, please do me a solid favor. Please subscribe. For the audio version of the show, you can search for SA Matters Radio on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio, or iHeartRadio. For the video version, you can subscribe to the SA Matters TV channel on YouTube. And if you find the show valuable for you, I'd really appreciate it if you'd give the show a rating and write a review. Your ratings and reviews help others to find the show, and it inspires me to keep up this labor of love. Since 2007, Situational Awareness Matters instructors have helped 
more than 1,300 organizations and have trained over 75,000 individuals to improve high-risk decision-making, including first responders, industrial workers, military personnel, business leaders, medical professionals, utility workers, highway workers, public transportation operators, aviation workers, oil refinery process operators, and more. If you work in a high-risk, high-consequence decision-making environment, we're here to help improve your safety and your survival and to help you accomplish the most important goal of all. And that is to go home to the ones who love you. I think Rich's, Rich's ability to, to, to connect with any crowd, that's a, that's a gift that he has and, it, and it's easily transferable. This is the second or third time that I've heard him speak. There's some teeth to, to the information that he, that he brings. It's been really good. Good mixes. He knows when to throw in a joke here and there to get you back involved. Some tools. Um, I'm a new lieutenant, so very, very interesting. And some of these things I can take back to the station and use with some of the new firefighters I have my, on my crew. Something to get you thinking about your job more, big picture type stuff. I've seen him before. A good review for sure. I have heard him before, yes. After he speaks, there's usually an enlightenment because now they're more aware of what's going on around them and what they're experiencing as they're responding to calls. He's, he's very, very knowledgeable. I'm enjoying it so far. And that intuition, that's a big one. Um, the video that he just showed up here, we're getting a lot out of this. this is, I think this is a really good seminar, especially for new people and old. So I think it's, it's very informative. This talk gives us more ammunition to, to do all three. They're relatable to what we have experienced or very well could experience, so it makes it easy to let the knowledge sink in. I mean, it's awesome. A lot of stories you can usually relate to yourself and, and calls you have been on, you know, aha moment. Like, he just helps you focus on picking out the right things. It's, it's awesome. It's a refresher and keeps my eyes open. It's good stuff. If people listen to the message that he has, it's an incredible message delivered by a very com compassionate person. Strategy and tactics are going to always change. Situation awareness is it doesn't change. You're all, it's always there. He's got some good stories to tell and he's very thorough with his stories and it's uh, interesting listening to him. Very clear speaker and he, he talks um, on our level because he's been there, he's been in the trenches. I think he's doing well and I'm looking forward to the second half. I would like to take a moment to honor and thank the companies, organizations, agencies, and departments that have hosted recent Situation Awareness Matters training for their members. Sin Crude Oil Refinery in Fort McMurray, Alberta, Canada. Quad County Fire Chiefs Association in Lewiston, Idaho. The Pearland Fire Department in Pearland, Texas. The Toledo Fire Department in Toledo, Ohio. The White Court Fire Department in White Court, Alberta, who hosted a live stream training program. The Missouri Winter Fire School in Columbia, Missouri, and the Topeka Fire Department in Topeka, Kansas. If you're interested in where we're going to be upcoming, here's the schedule. On February 22nd, we'll be at the West Virginia Emergency Services Conference in Pipestem, West Virginia. February 25, the International Falls Fire Department in International Falls, Minnesota. February 26, the Grand Rapids Fire Department in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. February 27th, the Eveleth Fire Department in Eveleth, Minnesota. February 28th, the Lutzen Fire Department in Lutzen, Minnesota. March 5 through 7, the Baytown Fire Department in Baytown, Texas. March 8th, the Ponderosa Fire Department in Houston, Texas. March 9th, the Northwest Volunteer Fire Department in Houston, Texas. March 12th, the Maryland Fire Rescue Institute National Fire Service Staff and Command Program in Towson, Maryland. And then March 25 through April 3, we'll be at the Pearl Harbor Naval Shipyard in Oahu, Hawaii. Oh, and if you're going to be at FDIC in April, look for me there as well. I'll be there on Thursday afternoon doing a program on situational awareness. If you want to see the locations of all the upcoming Situational Awareness Matters tour stop events, just head over to the samatters.com website and click on the blue box on the right side of the homepage labeled Live Training Dates. And if you're interested in hosting a program, just click on the Contact Us tab on the top of the samatters.com page and I will call you and we'll get something set up. 
If you want to become part of the SA Matters community of learners, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Check the show notes for how you can get connected with us by signing up for our monthly newsletter, subscribing to the SA Matters radio podcast, subscribing to the SA Matters TV YouTube channel, and how to follow us on the social media channels of Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. There we share ideas about how to improve situational awareness, how to make better decisions under stress, and how to improve the critical, the skills of critical thinking and resilient problem solving. Well, that's it. Episode 251 of the Situational Awareness Matters show is complete. Thank you to our awesome sponsor, Midwest Fire. If you're in the market for a pumper, pumper tanker, or brush truck, you need to check them out at midwestfire.com. Thank you to our associate sponsor, Chief Miller. Thank you to all the companies, agencies, organizations, and associations that have hosted Situational Awareness Matters training programs. Thank you to all the organizations that have hosted the live stream internet-based training programs where I come to the organization live via the internet to train your members. Thank you to the more than 2,500 students and graduates of the highly acclaimed Situational Awareness Matters Online Academy. The feedback I receive from Academy graduates is just amazing and very humbling. Thank you for that. But most importantly, thank you, the listeners and viewers of this show, for sharing some of your valuable time with me today. I really appreciate your support of the SA Matters mission. Be safe out there, and may the peace of the Lord and strong situational awareness be with you always. You've been listening to the Situational Awareness Matters radio show with Dr. Richard B. Gassaway. If you are interested in learning more about situational awareness, human factors, and decision-making under stress, visit samatters.com. If you are interested in booking Dr. Gasway for an upcoming event, visit his personal website at richgasway.com.